In the previous lessons, you've learned how a battery management system can measure voltage and temperature, and now in this lesson, you're going to learn how a battery management system can measure electrical current. Battery pack electrical current measurements are required in order to monitor battery pack safety in order to ensure that excessive amounts of current are not flowing. They're required in order to log abuse conditions. And in addition, they're required by most state of charge and state of health algorithms, including those that you will learn about in the upcoming courses in this specialization. But remember that we cannot measure any physical quantity directly except for voltage. So we cannot measure electrical current directly. Somehow instead we must convert the current into a voltage signal and then measure that voltage signal using an analog to digital converter and then from that reading infer what the current must have been. There are two basic approaches to doing this. The first approach is to use a resistive shunt and the second approach uses a Hall effect sensor and you will learn about both of those approaches in this lesson. First we look at the current shunt sensor. A shunt is a low-valued but very high-precision calibrated resistance that's placed in series with the battery cells and the load that they power. So usually at the negative terminal of the battery pack between the negative of the battery and the negative of the load. The photograph on the slide shows a current sensing shunt. The large screw terminals on the top are connected one to the battery pack negative terminal and the other one to the load negative terminal. And all of the current passing through the battery pack passes through this shunt current sensor. The parallel plates between the two large screw terminals are what form the calibrated resistance. And when current flows through the resistance, Ohm's law tells us that there will be a voltage drop such that the current is equal to the voltage divided by the known shunt resistance. If we were to use a large resistance, then uh, we would also, however, waste a lot of power with this device as heat, and that's not our desire. Uh, so we want to use a very small resistance. But when we use a very small resistance, the voltage drop across the shunt ends up being very small also. And so the voltage difference across the shunt sensor must be amplified before we sense it. And the calculation for current must be adjusted accordingly by dividing the measured voltage by the amplification factor before computing what the current must be. If we look at the shunt device in more detail, we notice that there are in fact four different connection terminals. As we talked about on the last slide, uh, the, the two terminals on the top are connected, one to the battery pack and the other to the load, and that the overall battery pack current flows through those two large terminals and through the shunt device itself. All of this battery pack current passing through these parallel plates produces the voltage drop that we want to measure, and the resistance that's actually calculated uh, calibrated on this device is the value between the two small screw terminals, not between the two large screw terminals. And the sensing leads that we use to measure the shunt voltage are therefore connected to the small terminals and not to the large terminals. And uh, so the, the large terminals don't have a calibrated resistance themselves and the connection resistance of whatever um, connecting devices we, we put on them to connect to the battery pack and the load also don't have calibrated resistance. And uh, that could be quite significant. It can quite significantly bias our calculations if we were to measure across the large terminals. So we measure across the small terminals instead. And it's very important to uh, connect a shunt this way. This connection style is called a Kelvin connection and it enables what is known as four wire voltage measurement. We assume that essentially no current is drawn by the analog to digital converter that's connected to the small screw terminals. And therefore the wiring between the A to D and the small screw, screw terminals has no voltage drop over it. And so uh, we are truly measuring the voltage drop across only that calibrated resistance. If we were instead to connect the voltage sensing wires to the large terminals, 
we would be measuring the voltage drop across the calibrated res resistance plus the voltage drop across the screw terminals in that connection. And a large current flows through those, and so there would be a significant I times R voltage change across the large terminals that would really interfere with us being able to get good measurements of what current is. We would make serious miscalculations. So to summarize the current sensor using shunt uh, sensing mechanism before we look at the Hall effect sensor, uh, I'll make a few comments here. So you've seen that in order to use a shunt sensor, we absolutely must use this four-wire connection, otherwise our measurements will all be wrong. Um, when we compare this method of sensing to the Hall effect method that we're going to talk about very soon, we'll find that an advantage to using the shunt sensor is that there is no built-in offset at zero current using a shunt. In other words, the voltage drop at zero current is I times R, or zero volts. And so a shunt sensor is good to avoid drift in certain kinds of state of charge estimation algorithms. In particular, in the third course in the specialization, you'll see that there's a simple method to estimate state of charge that's called Coulomb counting. And what it does is to integrate the current sensor measurements. But if there's a constant offset in the current sensor measurement, I'll be integrating that offset over time and I will get ever increasing estimation error. And that's, of course, really bad. So we desire a current sensor that has no offset, if at all possible, and the current shunt, in fact, does not have offsets, so that's really good. Um, but we do still have to be careful because even though the shunt has no built-in offset, the amplifying circuitry and the analog to digital conversion circuitry may have some offsets, so we still may need to calibrate some offset out. There's just going to be relatively little of it to calibrate out. When we compare this type of current sensor to a Hall effect, it also has a disadvantage in that the shunt is not isolated electrically from the battery pack. And in many times this is a requirement that the battery management system electronics be electrically isolated from the battery that they're managing. And in, if that's the case in your particular application, you will require extra circuitry to isolate this current shunt from your BMS electronics. So an example is an automotive application where traditionally the BMS is powered by the 12 volt lead acids uh, battery in the, in the vehicle and the other electronics, uh, the, the motors and so forth are powered by the high voltage battery pack. And so if there was a loss of electrical isolation between the BMS and the high voltage battery pack, that means that there is a loss of isolation between the 12 volt system and the high voltage battery pack. And if you know how standard automobiles are, are constructed, the 12 volt system is actually physically connected to the chassis of the vehicle. And uh, so if I don't have isolation between the high voltage and the 12 volt, I also don't have a isolation between the high voltage and the chassis. And so that's a safety consideration because someone touching the chassis could, um, could shock themselves and we don't want that. And so this isolation is a requirement that's not built in that we would have to add. And a design consideration when using a shunt is that we, that we desire to have a very low shunt resistance in order to minimize power losses. But regardless of whatever resistance we end up choosing, there will be some power loss. And this power loss will uh, result in heat buildup, and the heat buildup must somehow be removed by our thermal management system. So it places additional load on that system. Finally, you've seen that we need to amplify the shunt signal in order to get a measurable voltage. And anytime there's amplification, that introduces the possibility of amplifying random electrical noise in the circuit. And therefore, it can be important to shield the wiring between the shunt sensor and the amplifier from this electromagnetic interference. Now we look at the Hall effect current sensing method instead. Uh, this is based on a principle from electromagnetics where we find that if a coil of insulated wire is wrapped around a primary current carrying wire that um, this primary current carrying wire induces an uh, electrical current in this coil even though there's no electrical connection whatsoever it's done through the electromagnetic um, fields th that are built up when current is flowing through a wire. 
Hall effect sensors measure this induced current in the secondary coil and use that to infer what the amount of current prime passing through the primary wire must have been. So in the photograph on the right hand side of this slide I show an example of a Hall effect current sensor and I hope you can see there's a large oval opening in the sensor toward the upper right hand side and the large current carrying conductor would be inserted through this opening and there's no again no electrical connection whatsoever we just pass the wire through the opening and inside of this packaging for the Hall effect sensor there's actually a coil that wraps around that opening and there's further electronics inside of the package that measure the current going through this coil and produce an output voltage that's somehow proportional to that current to be measured by the battery management system and that's illustrated schematically on the right uh, at the bottom you can see the current carrying wire going through the center of the coil but it's not electrically connected and the coil wrapped around that secondary uh, the voltage across that coil um, or the current through that coil rather is is measured and is conditioned and uh, makes a voltage proportional to that current for the battery management system to measure as well. We can summarize some of the design considerations for a Hall effect current sensor that we need to think about. Um, one advantage when we use a Hall effect sensor is that it's automatically isolated electrically from the battery pack current because there's no electrical connection whatsoever between the primary current carrying wire and the sensor. So we don't require any isolation circuitry when we're measuring battery pack current. However, anytime we use electromagnetics, there is a physical phenomenon that we can encounter known as hysteresis. And magnetic hysteresis causes the present measured voltage to be a function not only of the present instantaneous current going through the primary, but also somehow a function of past current that went through this primary current um, carrying wire. So there's a history somehow embedded in the present measurement. And in some cases it's possible to purchase Hall effect sensors that have feedback circuitry that tries to eliminate this history as much as possible to give you as clean a present instantaneous measurement as possible. But no matter how good a job you do with this conditioning circuitry, there will always be some amount of hysteresis in your measurement uh, that you have to deal with. So this hysteresis means that a current reading after charging your battery pack for a while will be different from a current reading after discharging a battery pack for a while, even though the current might be exactly the same at this moment in time. And in particular, if the battery pack is resting and we should be measuring zero current, I will be actually measuring some value above zero or less than zero, depending on whether I've recently been charging or discharging. And that's a problem. If I'm integrating the current sensor in order to provide a state of charge estimate, then I will have a, this offset that will, cause, that will cause increasing error over time, and that's not desirable. So one possible solution is to measure current from the Hall effect sensor when the battery pack is disconnected from the load, and we know that current is zero, and then to use that as our default zero um, measurement and subtract that value from all future measurements. But unfortunately this bias uh, is not a static thing. It actually changes with time and it drifts with time and it changes with, te with temperature also in often unpredictable ways. So even if we come up with a clever scheme somehow to zero out this offset by subtracting an estimate of the offset, there's always going to be some uh, error in the reported current, some bias in the reported current that changes with time and with temperature. And this causes all kinds of problems with a number of battery management system algorithms, especially state of charge estimation. So if we are to use a Hall effect current sensor, some kind of compensation is necessary. And it's often also necessary to try to estimate the DC bias and to subtract that out from measurements in our algorithms. Because of this additional complexity uh, to the algorithms and the uncertainty that this adds to our estimates, I personally don't prefer Hall effect current sensors, but you will still find them in many commercial products, mostly because their built-in electrical isolation makes them very attractive to electronics designers. So in summary, 
we must be able to measure battery pack electrical current in order to monitor battery pack safety, in order to log abuse conditions, and in order to inform state of charge and state of health algorithms. You learned about two different methods that might be used. We may either use a current shunt or a Hall effect sensor. Both of these methods have their advantages and disadvantages, and both are actually in common use. And when you're designing your own battery management system, you'll need to evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of both to come up with the correct decision for your own particular design. That brings us to the end of this particular lecture, this lesson topic, and it brings us to the end of our three main sensing requirements of sensing voltage and current and temperature. And from now on for the rest of the week, we look at some other um, high voltage measurement and control aspects of measuring isolation and contactor control and thermal management system control as well. And that's what we start to do next.